Welcome. Good evening. We're so happy to have you here for our culminating event of One Book, One Marin, where we're going to celebrate reading The Wonderful Farm City by Novella Carpenter. My name is Sarah Jones, and I'm the director of the Marin County Free Library, and I couldn't be more thrilled to be a part of this event. There are such wonderful partners, um, Dominican University, I want to specifically note um, Denise Lucy, who's been so welcoming and helpful to make sure that this is a wonderful partnership where we all get these great events like tonight. Um, I also want to notice the uh, Private Ocean Wealth Management, who are a great partner in Dominican for these, these lecture series that are so important to this community and, and make us all think and wonder and uh, read, which, of course, we're always supportive of in the library world. Um, I also want to mention a few of the partners that really make One Book, One Marin so important. One of the most critical ones is the book Passage, which you're all aware of and hear what wonderful things are upcoming for us. It, none of this would be possible without all the libraries in Marin who really come together and make sure that this is possible, that the books are available, and that there are very interesting things to do as we read the book. So all of the libraries in Marin and the friends of the library who provide profound support in making this happen. Um, we have some platinum sponsors, the Gallardis, who make a, a, a very real difference in making one book, one Marin happen. So without further ado, because I don't think you came to listen to me, I'm going to introduce Karen, and off we go. Thank you. <laughs> I did want to say that from the time we come together as a committee and choose the book that we're going to read across a year in Marin County, um, it's a very feisty conversation. And then once we decide on it, and we all loved Novella Carpenter's book, and we felt excited about it, and it was like a beehive coming together and buzzing and going forth. You've seen programming throughout the communities. You've seen buses with her book jacket on the side of it. It's we really came together as a community, and it really is so good to know that you're out there with those books stuffed in your satchels, your backpacks, at your kitchen tables, wherever you're reading it. It's just thrilling for Book Passage, Dominican, and all the librarians to know this. So I'm going to introduce them. I want to say, first of all, that I'm addicted to NPR's forum show. It, I, how many of you, yes, yes, addicts, addicts? It streams into my life at all times, when I'm brushing my teeth in the morning, driving to work. I am the one of those people that when you pull up to me in the intersection, uh, my car doesn't have the bass thumping. It has forums host Michael Krasny's sonorous voice blasting out. Uh, you can see that I'm listening to my, my forum show in the morning. Um, I think Michael Krasny is the Tai Chi master of the art of conversation. He artfully shapes, illuminates, pierces, dodges, and frames, all with incredible insight and intellectual prowess, inserting powerful quotes with appropriate resonance, and he's actually a master teller of jokes. You may not know this about him, but I hope you've heard that on the show from time to time. Forum feels like one is getting a university education, so you'll not be surprised to hear that Michael is an active university professor at San Francisco State University. He is also the author of two incredible books, off mic, his amazing access to the great minds of our time, this book allows us to access the backstage of his studio, chronicling remarks and conversations that are truly extraordinary. There's a lot of dish in that book, and I suggest you read it if you haven't. Also, Spiritual Envy, an emotional and intellectual exploration of life without a godhead at the table, fascinating for those of us with a spiritual practice and for the rest of us who felt alone with our longing. Truly a Renaissance man about to appear in conversation with a Renaissance woman, Novella Carpenter. Novella was raised by parents who would be quite at home here in Marin County. Part of the Back to Nature movement, she was raised with an ethic and a passion for self-sufficiency and a fair amount of granola. Plop her down in one of the most urban settings in California, downtown Oakland, and see through her eyes the wasteland that is her backyard a space she envisions teeming with bees, chickens, luscious tomatoes, and a pig or two. She desires to live off the land that is her city backyard, and she does not tilt at windmills in this. She boldly goes forward and creates it, an edible, self-sustaining, pocket-sized farm. Charming, funny, and inspirational, Novella and her book, Farm City, will send you home with a desire to look, at your back, look out your back door and wonder what might just be possible. We're going to show a clip right now. Farm City, yes.
I live in West Oakland, which is um, a, just a part of Oakland that's been sort of traumatized. West Oakland is a total food desert, mostly because it's like all liquor stores, and they don't make any money selling fresh produce. I had this vegetable garden. I um, dug up my parking strip and planted fava beans and squash. This was an abandoned lot. It still is an abandoned lot. <laughs> um, and so we decided we would just start gardening on it. We went up to the beekeeping place and got our first beehive. And then I started hearing about people that kept backyard chickens. And I thought, well, I can do that. So I raised uh, turkeys and ducks and geese, and then rabbits, pigs, goats. Then I started running into people um, who would be like, yeah, I'm an urban farmer. And I'm like, well, what the hell is that? And they're like, well, kind of what you're doing. <laughs> Everything that I do is totally small scale, never like some business model. In an urban farm, you're going to grow stuff in usually raised beds, and you're going to do this interplanting kind of thing where you're trying to pack as much stuff in as possible into this little space. There's more of an attention to detail for the urban farm. You can go out and actually like hang out with your lettuce plants and like look at them and be like, are they doing well? A lot of people are like, well, why don't you just move to the country? And it's like, well, what I learned was that I could feed the animals from the waste stream. So I would be able to go to these dumpsters of these, like, you know, high-end organic um, grocery stores and feed my rabbits. <laughs> One of the biggest triumphs is actually seeing people from my neighborhood come in and harvesting food. It's nice to have community gardens where people can just stop by and pick stuff. And I mean, I love having a garden. I just, you know, I'll just be like, wow, what am I going to eat for dinner? Well, what's growing out there? So please, let's welcome Novella Carpenter and Michael Krasny. Well, thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, it's actually um, the eighth year that I've been your interlocutor here at One Book, One Marin nice. uh, since it started. Congratulations. And I always look forward to it because I see people I haven't seen in a while, and I, I usually um, am elated to see the interest in books and the desire to meet authors and also to read their work. So this is really something that I'm championing, I guess, uh, a little bit verbally. It's also a pleasure to be with Novella Carpenter. Uh, those of you who listen to the forum program, which I do. <laughs> <laughs> do they know uh, yeah. Well, they, they know. <laughs> you didn't hear Novella with me. You heard her uh, with Dave Iverson, uh, who does the Friday program and who does a splendid job. And um, so it gives me an opportunity to talk with her about her book and uh, to uh, uh, do what I miss doing uh, when Dave took over and um, took the reins on, uh, on her book. <laughs> I thought maybe, in fact, we'd begin by talking, Novella, about here you had this urban farming, which in some people's minds still seems oxymoronic um, just on the face of it, but this extraordinary experience and some great stories and some great anecdotes and so forth, but what made you or what compelled you to write a book about it, to hmm. tell the story? Um, I knew you were going to ask these kind of questions, and this is why Dave did a great job. Dave is more like, on page 90, you said this. Um, but I like these broad questions. I like to asking. go back to the Genesis. So. <laughs> That's good. Um, thanks for being here, by the way. And thank you all for being here, too. It's so nice. There's tons of you here on such a hot day. I love it. Um, okay, to answer your question, why did I write a book about it? Well, I was actually in um, journalism school, and I studied with Michael Pollan, um, who's the food writer. And I remember, you know, I was sort of like one of the students that was like the weird kid. You know, I was like the one that had like the weird pail that I, my food came in, you know, and I always had chicken poop on my boots. Um, and, but, you know, but I wanted to be a reporter. So I was very, you know, um, focused on learning those skills. And I had my notebook and I was like, I'm going to work for the New York Times or something. And I remember one day sitting in Michael Pollan's office and, you know, we're sort of talking about our future plan, what my future plan is. And um, he sort of 
let me know that maybe I wasn't the best reporter. You know, I would get people's ages wrong. You know, I'd spell their names wrong. Um, details weren't exactly my forte. And, um, and he said, you know, Novella, you're living this double life. You know, you're, you're, an, you're out there farming. You're like killing your turkey for Thanksgiving. Why don't you write about that? Um, and I, you know, this is why you go to grad school. So people will tell you what you sh obvious things about yourself. Um, <laughs> And I said, really, I can, I can do that? And so I, I had to have someone tell me, you know, allow me to basically tell my story. And tell so, you that you weren't a reporter. That, I, <laughs> that this was not going to work out. But actually, this other thing that you're doing is kind of interesting. So, so Pollen was a major influence. I mean, not yeah. only in terms oh, of yeah. getting you to write the book, but also yeah. as an educator and yeah. as a mentor. Well, and even before that, um, you know, I don't know how many of you guys read Power Steer. It was about him. It was, I think it was in 2001. Um, he wrote this essay in the New York Times Magazine about eating meat and how all, you know, all these, all these um, cattle are, are sent to these um, con confined animal feeding operations. Um, and, you know, I was just the kind of person that was just shopping at the Red Apple and buying whatever kind of meat. And I wasn't really thinking about stuff like that. Um, so he really, I think, opened me up. And then, I'll never forget, I was working one of my many jobs at the, um, at the nursery. I was working at a plant nursery called Magic Gardens. And it's totally like the kind of place you would imagine with, like, crystals or charging in a back room. Room and it's like elm no, gnomes and things, um, and uh, so magic gardens. And who walks in but Michael Pollan? And he's like, "Hey, I need a shade-loving, you know, drought-tolerant." And I was just sitting there like, "I think that's Michael Pollan," you know, like, "Oh my god!" And then when he handed me his credit card, I was just like, "You're Michael Pollan." And this is before omnivores, you know. It's like you know, Botany of Desire was his big book at that time. Um, and so I had this starstruck thing. And he's like, yeah, I'm teaching at UC Berkeley now. <laughs> so I actually sort of followed him. I tried to. And you're you know, pretty in line with him, I mean, in terms of uh, his food philosophy, which is not only an omnivore's dilemma, but it's been spelled out through a series of books and many of the articles that he's written. Yeah, I mean, I agree with most of the things he says. Um, it's just, um, you know, there can only be one Michael Pollan. You know, and I think that's one of the things we had to learn is that, you know, I wanted to write an article, I wanted to be a journalist like him, but actually through telling my own stories, it's actually maybe more effective than sort of doing like an expose about the cattle industry. Um, yeah. But as I read your work, it almost seems uh, that there is a, I use a word that's probably too overused and, and has too many connotations that I shouldn't use, but kind of an agenda maybe underneath it. You'd mm -hmm. like to spread the word that this kind of urban farming that you've done has value to it and that people should maybe be more engaged and more considerate about the idea of actually doing it. I don't know. I feel like I had no agenda when I wrote this book. Um, I, I I, I, there were times I remember when I would sort of, um, did you remember the Barbara King Solver book, Animal Vegetable Miracle? And it was, yeah. Um, and so um, she goes to the farm and raises all of her own food. And there's an element, when I was first writing the first draft of, of Farm City, there was an element of that, you know, that sort of, um, uh, wanting to spread the good word and the gospel. And my partner, Bill, who's, um, you know, my best friend and my, you know, great life partner, um, he pointed out that I sounded like a real brat. I'll use that word, because I think this is being recorded. Um, and, uh, you know, that I was just sort of, I just sounded too self-satisfied with myself. And so I took out all of those parts where I was sort of like, and this is why you should kill your own turkey. You know, it didn't make sense. It was like too extreme anyway. Like, who is going to do that? You Although, don't like to preach. Now right? I know I lots of people. I mean, right, he would say, this sounds preachy. He would write preachy in the margins and, and exit off. You know, he's, he's a, he loves using like giant, you know, red marker pens when he's going what, through my draft. What did you say to that yoga instructor who was preaching to you? Oh, about Raven and Baxter? What did I say? Uh, um, as oh, I, about cutting off, like stopping drinking coffee? Yes. Yeah, that's not okay. Um, <laughs> it's not okay to say you should stop drinking coffee. <laughs> you have to let people come to that conclusion on their own. And it's a horrible, usually epiphany that happens late at night in your own bedroom and you're going crazy. You also spoke about what you would like maybe to have visited upon her. Did I say something about her leg getting cut off? Yes. Yes. Michael, you read that thing. Yeah, well, I, I thought I was <laughs> impressed with your aggression. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. 
in, in going to Oakland, though, and in setting up this farm city in essentially what many people would find not only daunting, but maybe mm. even threatening, mm. I mean, tell us about your mindset when you actually made that decision. Well, I was, um, I don't know what my mindset was. I think I, I have a tendency to get myself um, embroiled into projects without thinking about the consequences first. Um, and this, this has happened with a lot of things. I mean, you guys saw, you know, the pigs, the goat, then I got goats, and then, you know, I have a child of my own now. And it was literally the same thing when I came home from the hospital with my baby, where I'm like, oh crap. I haven't read <laughs> a single book about parenting or raising children. I just thought, you know, I'm just gonna do this, you know? And I was kind of like that about birth, too, you know? I was, my sister was like, you know, get ready, it's huge. And I'm like, but the goats, you know, I've been helping them give birth, and it seems totally fine, you know? So, right, this is, so I have this kind of Pollyanna thing about myself where I'll just go and do something and then, then deal with it. You get this maybe from the hippie parents? <laughs> yeah, but see, the thing is, is it works. And, you know, if, if it works for you, then don't stop. Well, that's very it. pragmatic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if mm -hmm. it works, it works. Yeah. But I'm also thinking of, little did you realize that one person could lodge a complaint and, you know, everything would suddenly be tied up in bureaucratic red tape. And right. Suddenly you've got all those kinds of mm. uh, difficulties to deal with. Right. And so when you look back on it, as much of an adventure as it was, mm -hmm. and it's exceptional in many of the experiences, um, mm. it still feels good to have done this because you were feeding people. Right? Yeah. Well, because I was feeding people um, and I was feeding myself and most of all for me I was learning new things, you know, because whatever animal you're raising, it kind of becomes a reflection of who you are. And I mean, you know, so that says a lot, right? So for instance, when I was raising the pigs, um, all I could think about was food and how I could get more food, you know? And so if someone walked by and they like, hand, you know, threw some like french fries on the ground, I mean, I would die for those fries, you know what I mean? Like I carried a bag with me and we would collect food. Um, and similarly with the goats, you know? So um, I had the, and that's why I got pregnant, you know? It's just sort of this thing, you just see animal breeding and then you're pregnant. Um, <laughs> So watch out out there. Um, but yeah, so I think I just, you know, I, I don't, I think it was that, it was, it was feeding me too. And it still feeds me. I mean, those of you who are gardeners, or I don't know if you're a gardener, Michael, um, but it's, it, it's once, you know how you, when you're young, you think you know everything. And then once you start gardening, you realize how little you will ever know. You know, you could study it for, you know, 60 years and you still wouldn't know everything. I actually saw something just this morning that, gave, that, that startled me a bit, and I don't want to get on a morbid track here because it's mm. too much rich and funny to talk about. But I like morbid. Pardon you know what I'm saying? I like morbid, yeah. Well, maybe you know where I'm going with this. The, the, the suicide rates among farmers has actually mm. escalated. Mm. And it's higher than it's mm. been. I don't in like a long that kind time. of morbid, I mean, yeah. A lot of complicated reasons behind that. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I think it's, it's a hard life. Um, because you're dirty all the time. And a lot, in America, we don't really respect farmers. I mean, I think in the Bay Area, we live in a bubble a little bit. And, you know, everyone's like, I think I want to be a farmer. I mean, I, have, I teach college now, and I have students that actually want to be farmers. Um, and when I was, you know, going through college, that was the last, you're like, why are you in college then? <laughs> you know? And so I think there is kind of a disrespect um, with farmers in America, especially. And the financial hardship is massive. Yeah, we're not America Gothic anymore. We're more, no. I mean, an agribusiness is pressing yeah. on the individual farmers. A number of farms are just For sure. enormous shrinkage. Yeah. Um, yep. But let's get back to the funny stuff. Okay, yeah. um, <laughs> I mean, I, I guess one of the moments that was funniest for me as a reader, uh, and maybe some of you out in the audience felt the same way, but also um, funny in many, funny peculiar as well as funny, haha. Mm. It was all those fish guts and... Oh my God. Uh, and the homeless man giving you a buck. Right. That was a new low. That was a new low. Yeah, yes. Right. We hit bottom at that moment. You want to talk about that? Uh, some yeah. people who haven't read the book? Yeah, so... Um, well, okay. So we got the pigs, right? Because I w saw this flyer for a swine auction, okay? And... Yeah, I mean, you know. And um, so we went up to Mendocino and we went to the 4-H swine auction. Um, and, you know, we uh, were prepared to bring these, these pigs home. And they were selling, you know, pig chow at the, you know, the, it's like a fundraiser or whatever for 4-H. And I'm like, oh no, 
No, no pig chow for these pigs. It's never gonna pass through their lips. Partially because I had raised turkeys and had spent like $100 on feed just to you know, feed these turkeys. And then I just didn't, that didn't make any sense at the end of the day. Um, so you know, the concept was that the pigs were only going to eat food from the dumpster. Um, because we had sort of checked out the dumpsters um, <laughs> and noticed that they were full of amazing food um, that maybe we didn't want to eat, but maybe an animal like a pig would want to eat. Um, and so, but then I also read something that, um, that pigs needed a lot of protein to start off with. See, these are the things that I would learn. I would like have a book called like small scale hog farming, you know? And of course I got the pigs in the backyard and I'm like, page one, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I read this thing, and it's like they need a lot of protein because they have mat, they're growing so big, you know, they get, they get big. Um, and so I sort of had noticed that, you know, there was this fish place um, that had these guts um, <laughs> available, let's say. Um, and it was always in a black bag, like a black warbly garbage bag. You know, those ones that are like really strong because you don't want this stuff to break open. Um, and then Bill and I would like, of course, like open it and then pour it into these buckets. Um, and, uh, and so one night we were, we were down in Chinatown doing our usual. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, a, a home this happened multiple times, Michael. I just wrote about it once. Um, a homeless man actually came up to us, did a double take, because he's like, oh, these people have to eat fish guts. Like, what's wrong with them? Um, and this is why I love Oakland offered us probably his only dollar, you know? Like, here's a dollar, because you guys are clearly Mount Moore, you know, you're worse off than I am. Um, but this happened all the time, all the time. But I still can't forget the image of my pigs snorfing up the fish mackerel. The mackerel livers were like their favorite, you know, and they would just suck them through their nostrils. It was disgusting. When well, you said my <laughs> pigs, I mean, you got attached to a lot of these animals. That was a kind of paradox that you yeah. found yourself in. Let's talk about that because yeah. you're raising them essentially to slaughter them and eat them. Yeah, but you know, the thing is, is it's like most people who are going to raise an animal usually don't name them. And, uh, you know, in the case of Harold and Maude, um, they were named because my vegan neighbor came over and then named them, you know, thinking if she named them, then I would never be able to, you know, do the deed. Um, and it does make it harder, I think, if you name them. Um, although it is a sign of respect, too, in some ways. Um, I have a friend who has, is a goat farmer in Berkeley, and he takes them out for walks on leashes down the street, public street. Um, it's very Berkeley. Um, <laughs> But he's, he's like, oh yeah, I name all of them. And then, you know, then he puts them in the deep freeze. This is a little Jeffrey Dahmer, okay? And he's like, <laughs> tonight's dinner is Jonathan, you know? <laughs> and they're sort of celebrating the life of the animal by knowing it and acknowledging it. Now that may sound very morbid, but you know, it's also just the reality. And being a farmer, you deal with reality all the time, you know? And that's just part of, part of the deal. A lot of farmers wouldn't necessarily have taken on, well, bees, for example. Um, I mean, I just recently um, uh, was talking to someone who told me that he had decided to become a beekeeper, mm -hmm. and I didn't know this. Hmm. I guess I asked him about a few other beekeepers, and he said, well, I know who they are, but I'm a newbie. Yeah. I never heard that before. <laughs> um, yeah. But talk about what you dis why you decided to be a newbie. I mean, uh, in addition to all the other well, obligations the, of farming. Well, the bees actually, I gotta say, I mean, I call them my urban farming gateway animal. Um, so, right, so anyone who's like, honey, can we start keeping bees? Watch out, because that may, you know, next thing you know, you're gonna have two pigs in your backyard. Um, but big bees are actually, being a newbie is, except for the cash outlay, where you're buying the equipment, which is kind of expensive, um, is one of those things that after you buy the equipment, it's just honey. You know, it's, that's just all you're doing is waiting for the honey. Um, and, and the beekeeping, to me, one of the reasons why I started was um, my partner Bill is really into um, Sylvia Plath, Sylvia Plath the poet, um, and her father was a beekeeper. And he would read this beautiful poetry about beekeeping and it sounded so romantic. Um, so, you know, it was a very romantic idea, beekeeping. Um, and then again, when we got him home, I was, you know, then hyperventilating because holy crap, there's 10,000 stinging insects 
sex in my backyard. Um, and, you know, I'd get my suit on and, um, and all that stuff. Uh, so, yeah, it was, beekeeping is very satisfying. And I think it's one of the things that, yeah, that I would do for the rest of my life, you know, as long as I can lift those damn boxes because they are heavy. But it's just, a, it's just a beautiful, you know, dance that you're doing with nature. You're taking their honey. I mean, you're stealing their honey, let's be honest. Um, but they like to be busy, you see? <laughs> they enjoy being busy. Um, and so it's kind of fair. You're, I mean, you know, you're giving them a place to stay. You're their landlord. Um, so, and, and then the bees trigger other things. You know, now I've gotten really into fruit trees because those bees are pollinating those fruit trees. So it's this natural thing. So once you scratch the surface of urban farming, and, and I know you guys did a lot of fun things through the library, like these events where you learn about beekeeping. And, um, you know, I'm just saying, watch out, because once you start doing it, all of a sudden you're just more engaged in the world, you know? All of a sudden it's not interesting to watch television, you know? It's, um, it's more fun to go out and just sit there and watch your bees. So when these uh, young people that you're now an educator with say, I want to be a farmer, yeah. you tell them it's hard and yeah. you tell them it's difficult and yeah. that comes across in your work. Yeah. But what about the joys? How do you, what do you communicate along those lines about you know, hmm. the finer things of farming? Oh man, well, I mean, for instance, my students and I um, extracted honey um, last class period. And I've never seen, you know how class is. You're like in this room and you're talking, and then they're talking. And then all of a sudden to be out in the world extracting honey, which is, you're pulling the frames out and you're just cutting off the wax, and all of a sudden they, you, I saw in their eyes, they're like, I never thought this is where honey came from. I just bought it at a store. And so to watch that to me is totally satisfying. And then when they taste the honey, they're, I mean, I had two students come up to me afterwards and they're like, I want to start beekeeping. <laughs> um, and then they're like, how much do you charge? Because, you know, like for like a half pint of honey, you can charge like, you know, I don't know, 20 bucks or something. Um, and so then all of a sudden they're like, hey, this could be a cash crop. <laughs> um, you know, and I think we do have a brain drain here because of marijuana, to be honest. Um, anyone who's actually interested in, in plants and plant propagation, um, usually they start to thinking about growing pot. And so it's kind of a brain drain. So if I can at least get them interested in something, you know, that, that opens them up to the outside world, like beekeeping, or um, or even just you know the pleasures of the table, you know, just eating food that you just harvested, is there's just nothing like that. So those are those are the you know wonderful things for me. So if they tell you they're interested maybe in, in uh, cannabis more than. Um artichokes, you say what? Well, I say maybe do both, you know? And I think that is actually an approach that we should do um, in California because, you know, there's tons of pot farms in my neighborhood. Like, they're all behind those roll doors, you know? And in fact, I remember there's a, there's a moment in the book when um, there's a drug bust that happens where they, like, come because they were growing too many plants. And it was, like, six squad cars, and they, you know, opened up the gates. And, um, and then the police, just because it's OPD, um, they just left and they left the doors open. And so every kid in the neighborhood was running down the street with a pot plant in their hand, you know? And I was like, future, as I watch this from my window, because it's very much like street theater at my house, you know? I just watch weird things happen. Um, as I watch these kids running down the street, I was like, wow, this could be the new farmers, you know? This is like, they're gonna take those home <laughs> and make a bunch of money and then be like, I'm gonna do that again. And I, will ha I have, like, you know, not, I'm not, like, 12-year-olds come up to me and ask me, how do you take a clone, you know? And I'll show them. I'll be like, here's how you do it, you guys. But, you know, what you should grow is vegetables, too. Um, and it's true, you know, it's so nice to have a cash crop that you know and you can depend on. But then also you need, you know, crops to feed your family and to feed you know, the, your community, so something besides that. I think there should be some kind of program, and I talk to Barbara Lee or something about this, because I think it could be very cool. <laughs> like a natural uh, educator within the, within the hood, within the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and there was really a desire to find out about those things, wasn't there? Yeah, I mean, people, especially kids, really are just, they want to know everything, you know, especially with animals. Um, they're just drawn to animals. Um, and then when they get older, for whatever reason, they lose interest. But there's this, there's this like perfect age. It's like between six and 12. It's like they're just excited about nature and they want to know how things work. And, you know, I'll tell them stuff like, yeah, did you know that the chicken egg comes out of its 
butt, you know? <laughs> and they're like, oh my God! They think that's so gross. Um, but yeah, so there's, the, but then they think it's cool too, you know, because then they tell their friends, you know, so yeah. Well, when you undertook this project, when you were inspired by Michael Pollan and you decided to get this down and so forth, yeah. uh, how much did you know that you would be bringing in your own story? I mean, I, I should mention that um, there's another book that's about to come out. We might as well plug it. Uh, oh, yeah, do it. That Novella's <laughs> done, uh, really about her relationship with her father and... Um, it's, it was a lot more difficult to write, I think, than yeah. perhaps this was, mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. it's, it's poignant and it's emotional and there's a lot of um, things mm. that had to be resolved psychologically. But how much did you really plan to bring in Bill and bring in your family and all that? Well, it was a dance. I mean, I feel like here's how I work. I don't know how you do it, but um, I would go to my office and I would, um, you know, I wasn't like, I didn't have whiskey in my desk drawer, but, um, you know, after a couple hours of writing, I, was, I would have a drink. You know, it, was, it wasn't, you know, it was sort of a, it was just more, um, but it was a fun drink. And, um, <laughs> but with Gone Feral, my new book that's coming out in June, it was a painful drink. It was a drink to, you know, sort of put out the fire. Um, I'm interested in that metaphor you used, because I just remembered something Paul Oster once said, uh, rather well-known author from uh, New York who said writing a memoir is like mm. opening up a desk and trying to sort all the things in the desk out. Yeah. As opposed to writing fiction, which is maybe an altered state or something. Oh, God, I wish I could write fiction. Um, no, yeah, it was very hard to decide what stayed and what went. Um, and, you know, I'd never written a book before, and I had this book contract, and I was like, oh, my God, what, am I, what have I done? Um, and so, but I had a, um, Anne Godoff at, at Penguin, had told and this, you know, editor, she's great. Um, she's, uh, she's like, okay, you're one way at the beginning, and then you've changed at the end. And so those were my operating instructions. Um, and that's pretty much most of the editing that I got. Um, and so I was kind of on my own. Um, and I think it was just to tell a good story. You know, I wanted, there were definitely the classic stories that I wanted to tell. Um, you know, the story of Bill and I going up into the, um, to the hills to go get the horse poop, and then coming back and um, our neighbor, Billy, well his name's Bobby in the book, um, He's waiting for us there, and he just thinks we are so insane because we've got, you know, we're like, we need to get more poop, you know? <laughs> and he's just like, what are you doing? Um, and then we think he's crazy because he's wearing a little tinsel, you know, headband or something um, and walking around barefoot. But so, um, and so, yeah, so I think that was like, you know, I, try, I knew there were these key stories that I wanted to tell. And I organized it with the animals because it showed a progression. It's that thing of, you know, the bees were this like gateway animal, and then we did the turkeys, and then, be, then it was the rabbits. And so it was this like, you know, kind of, I don't know if it's spiraling downward or going up. I don't know. But yeah, so it was like this, it was an arc. Were you thinking of an audience? Did you have an audience? No, 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 no. Just wanted I to tell no the story? Audience. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to tell the story, out, yeah. yeah. And uh, how much editing? Um, in terms, well, I turned in a draft and, um, and they were pretty much like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> you know, so not that much editing, actually. And, you know, and it's rough around the edges, you know. I sometimes read, I'll read a little bit of Farm City and, um, and it does have, there's a, there's a roughness to it um, that I think my new book doesn't have. But you also have, uh, and, and uh, I think I would note this and highlight it, you have certain comedic gifts, I mean, as far as storytelling. You. Um, you have to tell a funny story in a different way, don't you, in some respects? I mean, highlight it in a different way, use your timing in a different way and all that? I mean, I, my mom raised us telling stories, you know, just funny stories that would happen. And so I think I have a little bit of her timing in terms of what I think is funny. And usually it's something that I'm doing something that's really stupid. Um, you know, so that's pretty easy because um, that happens all the time. And, uh, you know, and, and not, yeah, so that was kind of, that was kind of my, my, that's my comedic methods. I don't know, I mean, everyone who writes funny writes funny in a different way, you know? I don't think anyone, you know, it's, there's no like kind of, you, there's no like um, template that you can make, you know? So usually if, if it involves farm animals and poop and me doing something stupid, that's just like, boom, jokes. It's a formula. <laughs> Instant joke. <laughs> but not thinking of an audience. I didn't think of an audience because, um, uh, 
Because at the time when farm, so you guys, farm study came out in 2009, which seemed, it was a long time ago, relatively speaking. Um, and there weren't any er other, I mean, there weren't that many other urban farms. And now, anywhere I go, if I, you know, I was just in Kalamazoo, Michigan, doing a talk, and I was like, hey, where's the urban farm? And they took me to the urban farm. So there are urban farms everywhere now. Um, and so at the time, I just wasn't thinking of it as a trend. It was just this really weird thing. And I remember the note from my editor when she read it, she's like, boy, this sure is a weird book, <laughs> you know? And I think that the only reason why it became popular was because that's the way our culture went. It could have very easily gone the total other way and people would be into, I don't know, making their own shoes or I don't know. I don't know what it, what it would be, but it would be away from that. And so the trend is toward this, you know? I mean, there's like bees on this campus. You well, know? it's found its audience, so, but there, yeah. you know, there's a movement back to the land and there yeah. are people who are celebrating the idea of not transporting far sure. across the country, build, you know, yeah. uh, growing your own things and raising your own animals so you don't have to contribute to climate change. Uh, and, yeah. and it's, uh, That's true. Potential no. horse. And the, yeah. In fact, Barbara Kingsolver wrote a book, uh, I, I'm, you yeah. may be familiar with it, about yeah. spending a whole year in Virginia just raising all their right. own food and raising all their own livestock, yeah. And yeah. not depending on anything else. Yeah. I think it's why people um, avail themselves more now of... Uh, you know, looking at agriculture mm -hmm. in ways that perhaps they didn't before. I mean, you found an audience. Yeah, it's yeah, out there. yeah. No, I got yeah. I got lucky. I'd say. No, well, yeah. it's it's modest of you to say so, but I think um, there's there's something that's building here, and I and yeah. I like it. Yeah. I say. I well, like and it. and you know, it's a lot different. I mean, I read the Barbara King Solver book, and I remember that was even in my book proposal. Is that this is kind of a? Um, uh, I mean, I love that book, but it's it's more of a. Um, a realistic look at how hard it is. And also, it's that rejection of the idea that you have to go back to the country in order to live this life. I mean, she gets to live that life because she has, her family has this property and she can go farm it. I mean, my family doesn't have that property that they had back in the day. And so it's a reaction in some ways against that idea of that you have to, you only, you have to dream about having a farm, you know? You have to like save your money and, and then finally one day you'll make it and you can go buy land and move there. And that's what my parents did. And it was a disaster, you know? So it's like, if we don't learn from the past, then what, where are we, you know? And so I learned from my parents, um, and I learned You learned from their failure. From their failure. Yeah. Yeah, and so I saw that living in the country is super isolating, um, and you know, you have to drive everywhere, and just shit happens, you know? And <laughs> shit happens in Oakland, too, you know? I'm not gonna <laughs> say it's totally perfect, but at least, you know, if my radish crop fails, I can still go get dim sum. <laughs> and that's important for some reason. Well, I'm glad you took us away from the scatological here. We've been talking, talking about horse poop and shit happens. And, uh, Sorry. Uh, no, 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 that's okay. About it I, I didn't want to be morbid. I don't mm -hmm. know if you wanted to be scatological. <laughs> there, there is a sense, though, of a movement that's out there now. I yeah. mean, when you say you can go almost anywhere mm. and find urban farmers now, yeah. I mean, it reminds me of... Uh, just a few years ago, I uh, happened to be in interviewing Herb Gold, who's a local writer of oh. some renown, and he said, he wrote a book on, on bohemian culture. And he mm. said, you can go anywhere still and find bohemian culture mm. you know, in any big city. Mm -hmm. And mm. who would have thought that you could go into urban cities and find It's farmers? everywhere. It's everywhere now. Yep. And, and a lot of them have been inspired by you, I must say, like which, which actually prompts me to ask at this point for questions from the audience. Um, I think we've, we've hit the mark here. Um, and if you have questions or comments that you'd like to bring forward, um, please do. Um, I'm used to saying, you know, you can go to our Facebook page or tweet <laughs> us. Or, or in this case, it's just bring forth your questions and we'll... Um, I think Karen... Is Karen West still in Bond? Yeah, they have mics. The plan was for Karen to read your questions for... Novella. Oh, Pardon? yeah, they're going to do mics. Yeah. Oh, you've got the mics. Yeah, see, so look. So much better. Yeah, okay. even better. So raise your hand and we'll go to you. We'll find you. There are people raising their hands right there. Yes. I, I, my question is, uh, just as you had this gateway animal, the bee, Yeah. for yourself, were, did you have a metamorphosis? Were, were you a different person than you are now 
because mm. of the farming, would mm. you say? You mean different from when I first started? Yeah, and by like the who end. were you when you first started, I guess is part I mean, of the question. To be honest, I was like, I mean, obviously I was younger, you know, and I was, um, <laughs> I'm not going backward and aging. Um, I, was, um, I was also super idealistic. Um, and I'm probably not as idealistic as I am. I'm a little bit cynical. Um, but, but the cool thing is, is that... Is a little bit cynical? What does that mean? I mean, sometimes... It's like a little bit pregnant, isn't it? No, I know. Well, here's the thing. Here's what I mean by a little bit cynical. Is someone will be, someone will come to my place and they'll be like, yeah, you're raising rabbits. I think maybe you should have a worm bin underneath and you catch the rabbit poop and then, you know, get a zip line and that, you know, and someone that just goes on and on and on and like aquaculture, you know, and like someone wants me to have a fish farm out there, you know, and I'm just like, no, I'm tired. Like, this is what I can do bees and chickens and vegetables, you know? So um, I'm like, isn't this enough? <laughs> um, so that's what I mean about kind of cynical. Because then, after they say that, then I'm like, God, well, they should go do that. Because I think other people should go out there and keep pushing the boundaries of, of this movement. Um, and it's just not going to be me anymore that does that. I'm like, you know. Hopefully, I'm just like the matriarch now. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Other questions, again, just raise your hand or comments. Uh, yeah. I just have a quick one. We must have some urban Oops. farmers here. Do we, by the way? Yeah, Come who's a. Who's Did you see a show of hands just for my curiosity? Any, any urban farmers? Come on. Or aspiring urban farmers? Chickens. That could be lettuce, you guys. Okay. Come on, please. Get your hands up. There we go. <laughs> Um, I was just curious to know, as far as like all the, the water issues we're having now, mm. how huge are you ready for it this summer with all the plants and the vegetables you're growing? Yeah, so, well, okay, so with the drought, <clears throat> it's, I mean, the drought is huge, you know? Um, it's the, it's, it's, and it's a huge problem for everyone, but it's also a huge problem for urban farmers. And when I um, was, you know, looking at the season and looking at how bad the drought was, um, uh, I was like, I'm not gonna plant any vegetables this year. And I have done that before in the past um, because we're on municipal water. It's not like we're getting you know, farm grade water. We're using water that is perfectly drinkable to water plants. Um, and, uh, and in the past, I have just let the garden go fallow, put, you know, cover crop in, call it a day, not, didn't farm. Um, and then a friend of mine was like, no man, screw that. <laughs> wait a minute, if you're not farming, because the thing is, is that food costs are going to be so high from um, this, that, you know, I'm just, uh, so then I'm just going to go buy my food at the grocery store, or the farmer's market instead. And it doesn't really, I mean, I think there's things that you can do to save water and especially in an urban environment. I mean, gray water, having a gray water system. Um, and we had a gray water system for years. I mean, I say system in very big quote marks because it was basically this like water from our washing machine would just go into this giant drum and then we would water our fruit trees with it. But it was effective, you know, and it totally works. Um, and then using uh, dry farming methods. So I have, plant, I have a bunch of tomatoes planted, but I'm not gonna water them. So, um, and you can do that with lots of different crops. You can do it with, um, with pumpkins and potatoes. And so there's all these water saving devices that you can do. I mean, if I really um, was hardcore, I could ask my neighbors um, you know, to get their water and do gray water from my neighbors. Because actually in urban environments, you have all this water being used that's going down the shower, you know, and it's just going down the drain, so it could... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, I could give the neighbors buckets and be like, hey, you guys, will you put, you know? I mean, they already think I'm crazy. I won't have anything to lose. Um, Are you in favor of desalination? I mean, it's pretty expensive, but certainly along with greater conservation, it's one of the things that always comes up. I know, it always comes up, and it just seems totally insane to me. No, no, not desalinization. It's not, I mean, like, there's an infinite, uh, there's a finite amount of water. I mean, the water from the ocean, if, it's, if you know the system, it's like the ocean water is what becomes rain. I mean, just so then to take it and make us the rainmakers seems incredibly crazy. Speaking about the drought, we'll go to more questions in a moment. What really excites you as far as coming out of the ground? 
Oh, right now what's in my garden? Well, I'm really excited about, and also this touches on the drought, um, I'm growing a lot of herbs this year um, for a Mexican restaurant um, in my neighborhood, well, not my neighborhood, it's like in the housewives market, um, called Cosecha, um, and the chef, this woman, Dominica, said, hey, um, will you grow herbs for me? And here's some stuff from Mexico City that I got, and she has epizote and papalo and, um, you know, purslane, which is totally a weed. I'm like, yeah, I can grow that. Um, <laughs> and so I was given these, these herbs and then the mandate to grow them for her restaurant. So I'm gonna deliver to her um, tomorrow my first crop of epizote. But it's totally this, wa it doesn't need water. I mean, it actually doesn't like water. Um, so it's these perfect little systems that perfect you can set up. Perfect for the drought. Yeah. Perfect for the drought. Yeah. More questions. The, the concept of earthing, that Earth. earthing, well, some people have uh, you know, espoused the concept of, you know, a whole uh, understanding of being in contact with the oh. earth, of, you know, even grounding into a plate or something like oh, that, okay. mats and things oh, like that. Uh -huh, but yeah. if you just have earth contact, right. it's the same value. So. I, I mean, I think it's, it's therapy. You know, it's my gym, it's my therapist. Um, when I go out into the garden, I do feel more grounded. Um, anytime I take a trip and I have to go fly in an airplane, as soon as I get home, I want to go out in the garden and just get back in there because I feel like all flittery and, and out of it. So I think there is something to that. There's also this like healthy bacteria in the soil that if you, you know, consume it on accident, um, it kind of gives you like an endorphin rush. It's a little bit of a high. Um, you know Daphne Miller's work? Yeah. yeah, I figured you did. I mean, this, yeah. is, this is a this is an MD who's written a book about the soil and all of its yeah. uh, riches in terms of our immune system and how yeah. we can be healthier with healthier soil and so forth. Yeah, and she's basically saying like, go get your hands dirty and you know then lick your hands. I mean, she's it's it's healthy for us to do that. And you know, even today now I see this like this soap that you get to wash your vegetables. And I mean, if you are using conventionally grown stuff, maybe, but you shouldn't have to do that. You should want to consume some of that dirt. It's good for you. And I mean, my daughter, you know, today, this morning, we we're eating carrots and, you know, she's like, it's dirty. And I just kind of rubbed it off barely and just gave it to her. And I know she's so healthy. I mean, she hasn't been sick at all, knock on wood. Um, but yeah, so I think there is something to that. I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more though about what you deem to be the therapeutic values of doing farming? Well, like a garden writer always writes, if you have a garden for long enough, eventually you will write about it. So I'm writing about things that happen to me in the garden in my head. I mean, and that's a lot of how I wrote Farm City was just, you know, I'd be like, crap, I have writer's block, and I'd just go out, work in the garden for a while. And it's amazing, because I won't really be consciously thinking about the problem at hand, whether it's how that story hooks up to any of the other stories um, or what, but that, it will just come to me later after I've worked in the garden. I don't know, it's like magical. I don't want to be all woo-woo, but there is something magical <laughs> about being in the garden um, and just being in the presence of that and being a steward of that, you know? So just helping things grow and, and monitoring them. It's like your own, it's your world that you can create. And there's something just very soothing about that. Well, I don't want to get too literary here, but I started yeah. off asking you about the genesis of your book and gardens do remind us of something. Yes. There's a, there's a word that I always uh, like to avoid because it sounds too pedantic, but prelapsarian, you know, mm. that's where we began in the garden, at right. least according to Genesis. Yeah. Um, more questions from uh, the audience, yes. I was interested in how you uh, constructed that above the ground uh, box garden. Um, mm -hmm. Did you do it yourself? And if you did it yourself, I would just, just briefly, uh, how did you go about it? Oh yeah, how do you build an above the ground, like a raised bed box, um, garden box? So basically, this is, and you gotta remember that my gardening style is kind of on the Appalachian side of things, okay? Um, but so we would, <laughs> We would find wood, but you could buy wood. Um, and it's better to use something um, like redwood. Um, you don't want to use treated wood because treated wood has you know, yucky stuff in it. Um, so you don't want your vegetables to be touching that. Um, and, uh, and then you um, basically, what I would do is just build a square and, on, and I'd take four posts you know, that were like this big and then I would drill those to the two. You know, and they would dr drill that to the two sides. And then there would be another one here. Is this a pretty good instruction here? And that's all you do. That's all you do. Like, just go look at, a, at um, other garden beds. That's pretty much what they're doing. They're just making four posts and then connecting the sides, and then they just put it on the ground. But the thing is, is that you have to, a lot of people want to do that because they have weeds or something. Um, and the problem with urban, are you in an urban area? 
Well, right, that's what I'm going to talk about. So urban areas generally have, um, not generally, but are more prone to have uh, more contaminated soil. And partially it's because paint was lead. It had leaded paint, you know, lead in the paint. And then when those houses burn or chip off and flake, then they go into the soil. And so that's our big problem with more, um, you know, urban farming type soils. A lot of that problem with lead is unfortunately particularly true about Oakland. And it prompts yeah. me to ask you, Yeah. Uh, we do a lot of programs uh, about Oakland. In fact, recently had on Mayor Kwan and you know oh, yeah. all kinds of uh, the, the, the city manager and so forth, hmm. because we like to be Trans Bay and we like to focus on obviously hmm. when you're Trans Bay, you've got mostly San Francisco and San Jose and Oakland. Though Marin is not forgotten, um, but there's a lot of uh, I, I just like to get you sort of to talk about Oakland. Yeah. There's a there's a Chris Rock bit where he gets in the car and he turns on you know. The GPS, and he says he wants to go to Oakland, and then, you crazy? You <laughs> really? really? Oh man, I um, love Chris Rock. Now, <sighs> you know, I, I don't want to diss Oakland, yeah. but you know that kind of humor speaks for itself. And, yeah, and there is yeah. a lot of that feeling. About oh Oakland. yeah, there's. A, I mean, that was one of the reasons why we moved there. I mean, it's not. I don't think we talked about it. I talked about this in the book, but you know, people people are like, don't go to Oakland, and anytime people say that, that's like I'm like. I am going there tomorrow. That sounds wonderful, you know? And people are like, don't go to Somalia. And I'd be like, I'm gonna go, you know? Um, but yeah, so Oakland has, you know, has its problems, but in some ways, this, is, this was the only place where my farm could have happened. Um, and one of the, you know, the other well, reason- Why do you say that? Because it's not, uh, because my, in my neighborhood, particularly, Ghost Town, um, is it's a place where it's very, there's a lot of people doing whatever they want to do, and it's not regulated um, in the way that certain, you know, housing, uh, what do they call them? The housing communities that are like, don't pa paint your house pink. I mean, whatever, you just like paint your house pink however you want in my neighborhood. Um, and, you know, there's people selling drugs, and there's prostitutes, and there's drug dealers, and, you know, so there's this sense of everyone's doing something that's not quite legit. And so for me <laughs> to get into that mix, you know, I'm like, who's gonna complain about the pigs? The drug dealer? I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like that scene in Reservoir or dogs where everyone's like pointing a gun at each other. It's just like everyone has done something illegal. There's taggers and people But you are... did have a neighbor complain. Well, I didn't have, was, that was not from a neighbor complaint. And this is like where I learned a lesson. Is when I, so we actually bought the property that we're on now. Yay! Um, yeah. Um, the woman who ended up owning it after Jack Chan wanted just, she wanted to get rid of it after the financial crisis. And um, so she sold it to us for a very cheap amount of money. And, um, but then as soon as my name became in the books on the Oakland, you know, ledgers, um, that's when the city people started showing up and being like, we're looking for Novella Carpenter, who owns this land, <laughs> who's illegally farming here. And so that's how that happened. And part of it was a complaint, and that was that, um, people, and this is another thing, is like, don't have a blog and tell them all the illegal things you're doing. <laughs> you know who's reading it? The city of Oakland managers. So, um, I didn't know. I still have to be like, oh, I shouldn't put that on my blog because someone's actually reading this. Um, and also I wrote a book uh, called Farm City and um, people would literally call the complaint line and read passages from Farm City. <laughs> and maybe it was one person, I don't know, but it wasn't a neighbor, but it was someone who didn't like me. Um, and then that's when they sent out the inspectors, and that's when they came, that's when the whole thing kind of collapsed for me. Um, yeah. Well, I know that uh, this evening's audience uh, has enjoyed this conversation, I would hope. Um, that's a cue for you to applaud if you actually... <laughs> But before we conclude, I wanted, and, and I turn things over to Karen again, I wanted to say that Novella will be signing books and it's an opportunity for you to actually have some contact with her and get her to sign you a copy of her book. But yeah. can we say something about this next book? Because it's, yeah, sure. yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's do it. done, really, yeah, isn't it? It's Gone the... Feral, Tracking My Dad Through the Wild. Yeah. It's, um... Gone Feral, I know. The, um, some bookstore owner was like, that's the best title of this season. And I'm like, yes, Gone Feral. It actually was a title before it became a book. 
But give us a little tease about it. So what it is is, um, well, you know, my dad, if you guys read Farm City, my dad was sort of this like shadowy figure in my life growing up. And kind of an inspiration, like I sort of imagine him as like Thoreau off in his like cabin doing things. Um, and so I had this idea that, um, well, when I started thinking about having kids, you know, I was like, wow, what is up with my dad? And it's one of those questions that we all ask when we start thinking about having kids is, um, are, am I going to pass that trait on to, to my child? Um, and so I needed to sort of find out who my dad was. And I originally pledged that, I, you know, I, I talked to him and I was like, hey, and we communicate through email, which is kind of funny because he's a total technophobe. Um, but I was like, hey, how about I come up and we'd go bow hunting together and you teach me mountain man skills. And I had this idea. I knew I was going to write a book. I already had the title in my head, Gone Feral. Um, and I had this idea that I would go feral and that I would become like, well, uh, this was before the Hunger Games had come out, you know, but, you know, I'd be out there and I'd be like, and I went to primitive skills camp and learned how to like, you know, tan leather and make fire um, with this idea that then I was going to write this book about this like amazing moment when father and daughter finally look at each other and say, I love you. You're just like me. Um, but then, you know, I got to my dad's house and it wasn't like Thoreau's cabin. It was like... Ted Kaczynski's cabin. <laughs> so, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> thank you, Novella Carpenter, and thank all of you. Thanks. <laughs>